Hey, we're back. And as the rabbit looks a little bit different. Um, we've gone through and we've separated out all of the different muscles that you need to know. And I'm gonna show you really quickly just kind of what that entails before I start going over the muscles. So like here and in this leg, like see all of these are separate because when you just, again, when you just take off the skin, you still have this tight fascia, this connective tissue that is wrapped around everything and it really makes it so it's really hard to tell however many muscles you have in an area. So, you know, there's the leg coming out here, the arm. It's a little easier to just parse it apart with your hand, break through this to separate them out, but it's still really hard to see the individual muscles without that preparation. So skinning it, that's not, you're not done when you skin it. So a lot of prep work to get this one nice and pretty. And so now what I'm gonna do is you have this list, this went out with the announcement, don't worry, you can read that. You will have it. Those are the 22 muscles that you will need to know for the lab exam. Well, what I'm going to do, and they are labeled 1 through 22 in there. I'm going to have a bunch of little flags, 1 through 22. And I'm going to show you where they are. And I'm going to talk to you about them on the rabbit as we go. And Justin is here. You can add anything as well. And Chris, if you have any. And you see, I also, uh, as soon as we stopped, I prepared off a little bit of the muscles in the face. So little stuff not on camera so we're going to start muscle number one on the list is the masseter and you can actually feel your masseter when you grit your teeth it's your cheek muscle there and this is muscle for grinding you know when you're grinding shutting your jaw the back so there we go masseter and what you you for the lab exam you're going to need to know just the identification um, but a couple of them i might ask you you know what is the function of this muscle. Where does it originate? Where does it insert? And I'll go over some of those when we go through here, but you know, look in your lab manual or I guarantee you thousands, millions of people are studying muscles right now. Look up some of this yourself and you know, supplement your list with where the origin and insertion is. Um, and you know, for muscles, remember, the insertion is always on the mobile bone. The bone that is wiggling about is where it inserts. Its origination is the relatively stationary bone. So the masseter shuts the jaw. So what does it insert on? The jaw bone, you know, somewhere on the, the dentary and it's um, originating from the skull. And you can get, you know, more specifics in that list, but that's the important information. So again, masseter and right here, this muscle, it is huge, it's big in animals that typically grind. So it's pretty big in the rabbit. The other major muscle of mastication is the temporalis. And you can feel that on your temples if you grit your teeth. Um, that's more a carnivorous muscle. It's not really big in the rabbit. I didn't bother to try to show it. So then muscle number two, we push everything aside here a little bit. And you look here, these are glands. We'll deal with those next time um, here. So this muscle right here, same muscle here, same muscle here, get my little two flag. This is the digastric and this muscle, pretty small muscle. It has an important jaw though as well, related to the jaw. The digastric, and the same muscle on the other side, the digastric opens the jaw. And that's why it's so small is, well, if you just kind of relax, your jaw kind of opens up a little bit anyway due to gravity. But if you want to fully, open it, that is the digastric muscle. So that's that. Now, th muscle three on the list is this one. And this one has a long name. Um, on the list it says sternocleidomastoid. It might just be sternomastoid in different dissection guides. Um, some of these, like, I'm using the human homologous names um, most times, not all the times. Um, and this might be when you're like, oh, the name is so long, I hate that. Long names and muscles are really, really good. So this is the sternocleidomastoid, just a sternomastoid. This is a muscle that runs from the sternum to the mastoid process of the skull. The name of the muscle tells you its origin and its insertion. And this is one of your neck muscles and it you know moves, allows you to turn your head 
side to side. You know, it moves the head around. So there you go. This is the, I'll take the pin out, and this one right here, this is the sternocleidomastoid, or the sternomastoid, depending. Okay. So those are the head muscles you have to know. And we're going to flip over because we're going to go to a pair of muscles that, you know, learn them as a pair. So this is, see the, see how wobbly the arm is? Because your arm is really just held on with soft tissue. There is no nice bony connection like you have in the, uh, the leg. And so this is very floaty now. And here's the scapula, so the shoulder blade. Humerus is here, radius and ulna. So here's the arm. Here, your scapula, and this is one thing where too bad you can't feel it, but there is a scapular spine right here. Can you just grab a scapula from the pile? Look at the pile of scapula off in the corner, just off camera. Um, so here, these muscles here, one thing about muscles is they kind of work downstream, is important to remember. Muscles that originate on the torso and insert on the arm are going to move the arm. Muscles that originate on the humerus, um, originate on the scapula and insert on the humerus are going to move the arm here. Muscles that originate on the humerus and insert on the forearm are going to move your arm like this. And muscles that originate on the forearm and insert on the digits are going to move the digits. So you can think that it's like puppets, puppeting down stream. And Oh, no. oh, we don't have any isolated scapula. Um, what the scapula, what I hopefully get one of you and show you, is that there is a spine on the scapula, which is projection um, outward, and the scapular spine divides the top of the scapula from the bottom. And on the dorsal aspect of this spine, there we go. Here's a human one. It's a little bit different from the rabbit, but you can see the scapular spine here. And so on this side, so the side that's medial, you know, or dorsal, you know, more towards the middle, on top of that, that is the supraspinatus. And that's why it's named that one, because it's relative to the spine. So we have the supraspinatus, and then we have the infraspinatus. So these two. So they can see. Oh, there we go. There we go. Just the cameraman, he, he sees what is, he sees what is actually being captured. So supraspinatus on this side of the scapular spine, infraspinatus here. And this is one that, if you are asked this, probably they will both be pinned in a photo and you'll just have A and B and you'll be asked which one, so probably, no, no guarantees. Um, other muscles on here you might be familiar with, um, like Terry's major, all that, but you don't have to know those. But other ones you have to know, so then we have the acromiotrapezius, which is actually, I've uh, detached a little bit so that we can better see the supraspinatus. So, the acromio trapezius here, one of your trapezius trap muscles. So that is number six on the list. So this one, it is actually inserting on. Hold it like a little bit. There we go. This is actually inserting on the acromion process of the scapula. That's why it's called the acromio trapezius. And it goes here. It's one of your traps, one of these little triangle muscles that will elevate the arm like that. So there is the acromio trapezius. So this one right here. Okay, now we're gonna go to muscles you're probably familiar with on the arm itself. Let me flag each other. So here again, so this is this would be your shoulder. Here's the humerus, the upper arm. So we have this side, this double headed muscle. This is the biceps. See one right there? Here we go. We'll kind of stick you like that. There we go. There's the biceps. Biceps brachii. Biceps brachii. And that's, you know, if you're going to go like this, you're flexing. And there's your biceps right there. Mine's not very impressive, but maybe yours is better. So there is the biceps. And then the antagonistic muscle to the biceps is the triceps. It's right there, the triceps going on the back of the arm. So we have biceps brachii and triceps. And biceps has two heads. Triceps, three heads. So, again, not very creative naming. And that is the arm. And again, these are antagonistics. Biceps flexes, triceps extends. Because all muscles can do is contract. So when that muscle relaxes, well, just relaxes. It doesn't push it back to where it started at. You need to have these pairs of muscles. Now we're going to move to the back. And 
skin. So this is sometimes called the swimmer's muscle. This is the latissimus dorsi. And there we go. It might be misspelled on your list. I'm going to hopefully fix that before I actually send it out to you. So latissimus dorsi, you know, also called the swimmer's muscle. If you do swim, do the backstroke, you're going to have a huge latissimus dorsi. Michael Phelps, huge latissimus dorsi, huge, huge every muscle, but especially that one. And so it's this triangular muscle here. It's originating from the midline down the sagittal plane of the back. It's inserting on the scapula. There we go. Now another muscle you are probably familiar with. Here, we're going to take some of these out. We're going to get a little, little hard to see. There we go. One you're probably familiar with is the pectoralis. So, you know, this muscle, it's the pecs. This is the muscle that is allowing your arm to move like this. So, pectoralis. It's right here. This is our pectoralis. And, you know, this is the giant muscle. And it's birds fly. This is, you know, chicken breast. Huge, huge muscle right here. Pectoralis. There we go. Huge. Again, these numbers correlate to the list of muscles you're going to be given. Now, if we go a little uh, caudal to the pectoralis here, we have a muscle called the serratus ventralis, also called the serratus, what is it? Anterior. Anterior in humans. Um, that's just because, again, if we're bipeds, this is going to be going anterior, but we're not, we're quadrupeds, so it's going ventral. I'm using serratus ventralis because that was the first name. And it's serrated here. This is a throwing muscle like if you played baseball or something you would have huge this is pitcher's muscle, pitcher's muscle. yeah right there and so this is again encourage you to look up the origins and insertions and specific action there is 11 on your list now we're going to journey even more caudally and we're going to look at the abdominal muscles now up here this thoracic cavity, this is protected by the rib cage. You got all these bones down here holding everything in. Your abdomen, this is all just soft tissue. So you, you have to have muscles that keep your guts from spilling out to hold everything in place. And the way that works is, this is very thin. Look how thin that is. I'm always amazed like how thin that is. That's just not much thicker than the skin that was over it. So the way this works, and you see we made these little flip books, is you have a series of muscles, three of them, that the muscle fibers are going in different directions. So first on the outside, you have your external oblique, and it's the outside, you know, that's how you remember. And these muscle fibers, can, can you see the muscle fibers in the video? Mm -hmm. Okay, they're running this way. They're running this way, the probe. they're going that way. Now, if we then cut through and we make a little flip book and we go to the next page underneath we see the internal oblique and they're running that way so they're running at a right angle to those ones that makes it stronger and then if we go all the way inside we have the transverse abdominus where these fibers are running transverse they're running that way so it's basically you have these really thin muscles that their fibers are running in different directions and this is what allows the strength. Now there is another series that is not on your list because it's sometimes obliterated by the preparation they do, which they run this way. And this is the rectus abdominis. And we have a little bit right here that I pulled out, but it's mostly obliterated. This is like you can get a six pack. That's what you're working. You're working your abs, the rectus abdominis here. So rabbits aren't known for their six packs um, and the muscles mostly obliterated. So it's not on your list. Now, these are a little hard to pin. Gonna give it a go. So. We've got 12 is the outside. External oblique. And then our middle page is 13, our internal oblique. And then 14 is our transverse. And this is one that, you know, when you have the quiz, you might just be told, hey, or the, the exam might just have a picture where it just shows you muscle fibers running this way. Well, you need to know that is transverse, so. And they all just line up like that. And look how thin those are. Incredibly, incredibly thin. All right, now we're gonna go to the leg. And it's the last region we're really gonna look at. But it's the rabbit leg. There's a lot to talk about. And I mean legs, even if you are a quadruped and you're not a rabbit that moves by jumping, 
Um, the primary propulsive force is always the leg. The arms, yes, they move you around, they provide propulsion, but they're, they're more steering you around, especially in mammals. Propulsive force is the legs. The legs are always typically going to have more well-developed musculature than the forearm, than the arm before them. So we're going to start with this huge muscle. We're going to flip it over the biceps femoris. Look at this. This is chunky right here. And this is one, this is a, the most time when we had our paws to prepare out to cut through this really thick fascia because again, it's so thick because these muscles are so active that they need to be really held in place because the connective tissue, it's holding them in place, not just to protect them from any damage from the outside world, but because they're contracting, you know, they're constricting, they're wiggling about, it's holding them in place with each other. So here, this is a huge muscle here, the biceps femoris. And again, you know, I'm deliberately not telling you all its specific actions, its origin and assertions, because I mean, you look that up. But don't think that means that for each of these muscles, you have to know four distinct pieces of information. Because a lot of times, the names are going to give you a big clue. And if you know the origin and insertion of a muscle, well, you already know its action, because all muscles do is get shorter. So there is the biceps femoris. And then we have our tensor fasciolata, which if we go, so this way, we go medial here on the outside, the tensor fasciolata, this one has the extremely thick fascia on it, hmm, for the name. This is this muscle right here, so on the front of the leg. Then we have our semimembranosus back here, back of the leg right there. So here all in a row. So this one in the middle, biceps femoris, tensor fasciolata, semimembranosus. And we're going to flip the money. And we have the in ones on the inside. We have the gracilis right here. So this is the inner muscle, muscle of the inner thigh here. Let me actually get a probe go underneath it. There we go. Here is our, this one right here. This is the gracilis. Then this very thin muscle that if we just go a little bit lateral from it here, that kind of runs at a cross angle. That is the sartorius. Uh, if you take ANP, it's also called the Taylor's muscle. I'm using that, use it cross-legged. Then we have a deep muscle we're going to talk about, the adductor magnus. Now most of these muscles, if you're just kind of doing a general overview, they've been superficial. But we actually have to, here's so, you know, bilateral symmetry, this is also the gracilis. If we cut the gracilis and we reflect it to the side, see we've revealed a completely new muscle underneath that is not exposed on the other side. See, I put my hand here, go to the other side. Nope, it is clearly, you know, this is deep muscle of the inner thigh. This is your adductor magnus. And if you know your anatomy, if you know your movement terms, Adduction is when you're bringing a limb into the body. Abduction is when you're taking it away. So, adductor magnus. This has something to do with adducting the leg. Magnus, big. In anatomy terms, not very creative. So I'm going to try to keep these in here. I'm going to flip them again. Or her again. And the gluteus. So the glute muscles. Now, you might want to think like, oh, it should be here. No, because remember, we're, we're a quadruped. We're not a biped. So where your glutes are and where the rabbit's glutes are in a slightly different place. Um, and, so, and also the glutes are very, very important muscles for biped locomotion. They're not that important if you're a quadruped. Um, that's why, you know, when animals stand upright, they don't have the same profile we do. When non-human animals stand upright, quadrupeds stand upright, they don't have the same profile because they don't have the same muscles to do that. Um, so the glute, this muscle right here, it's kind of, it's even hard to see. It was kind of hard to prep out right here, like this one right here is the, the outline of it. That is the glute muscle. That actually is homologous to your gluteus maximus, which is very large muscle in humans. Not that important in quadruped. But we're going to leave off the last muscle is one that is extremely important in both a quadruped and a biped. This is the back of your lower leg. This is your gastrocnemius. And this is a muscle that is connected to your foot via the Achilles tendon, and this allows you to point 
your foot. So if you imagine you're a rabbit, it's part of the thing that doesn't hop. I mean, these ones are letting them hop too, but this one's very important. Your gastrocnemius, it's very big in bipeds as well as quadrupeds. It's very big in everybody. Um, you know, this is a muscle that is a big part of the drumstick. Going for that one. So gastrocnemius, again, you know, starting up here, kind of the knee, back of the knee joint, all the way down here. I'm gonna prep it out a little bit more. There, there, 22. So that is the overview of the 22 muscles you're gonna to need to know. And again, the way it will work is there is going to be a quiz that's associated with this video and the previous video. Again, we're gonna call this one 1B or something. And we're gonna ask you some questions. They're gonna be also based a little bit off um, the lab manual, um, but off these videos. And there'll be some images in that as well. Um, still kind of thinking fully, finalizing what that's gonna be like. And that's gonna be your points for lab. You will still have a lab exam, which is gonna be in a very, very similar format to how your animal part of lab exam went, where you're gonna have photos of different parts of the anatomy, and you're gonna to need to tell me what you're looking at. I am gonna give you a list. So there's, if you have taken a &P, I'm sure you were seeing tons of other muscles on here. I referred to a few other muscles. You won't have to know those. They're not even gonna be extra credit questions. The only thing I'm gonna ask you are for muscles, 22 muscles we have here, and then there will be additional things that we're gonna get in other, we're gonna have two more videos next week. Um, we're gonna be looking at the nervous system, and we're gonna be looking at the internal organs. Well, I mean that, the nervous system too, but we're gonna have a couple videos. Um, we're gonna look at the rabbit's heart, lungs, and its abdominal cavity. Oh, pinned it to the tape, pinned it to the thing. Oh. And then we're also gonna do a sheep brain, an eye, and a heart too, right? We have a sheep heart, yeah. And we're gonna look at some models as well. So that's gonna be next week. Um, but that is it. So, you know, email me or Chris uh, if you have any issues. Um, Dr. Alex is not directly, I mean, he's involved with this part of the course, but he's just gonna forward any email you send about any of this um, to me. So just email me right away. And remember, I do have virtual office hours where I'm in my WebEx room every Tuesday from one to three and Wednesday from two to four. You can stop by and catch me when I'm not paying attention because nobody stops by and it'll be funny for everybody. So have a good one. I hope that this was informative and I hope you're all staying safe out there. Bye bye.